The 17 News at Sunrise podcast is brought to you by Clinica Sierra Vista. Welcome back to the 17 News at Sunrise podcast, where we share your news on your schedule. Working in the spirit of the Golden Empire, this is 17 News at Sunrise. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for waking up with us. I'm Maddie Jansen alongside Tolly Anderson. The man accused of shooting a Kern County Sheriff's deputy is scheduled to make his first appearance in court today. KCSO says 19 year old Edgar Rojas was trying to open car doors around 3.30 Friday morning at the Sierra Vista Mobile Home Park in Rosemond. Deputy Michael Valdez and his partner approached Rojas, but KCSO says he ran off. Now the deputies later found Rojas half a mile north in an alley on Low Crust Street. That's when they saw Rojas fired, hitting Deputy Valdez in the head, nearly taking his life. Deputy Valdez was taken to the hospital, treated with just stitches and release. Rojas was arrested later that morning. He faces several charges, including attempted murder on a peace officer. And a woman arrested on suspicion of murder for allegedly killing her boyfriend in Ridgecrest is due in court today. Police say they found a man who had been shot in the head at a home on East Wilson Avenue around 2 a.m. Sunday morning. Now, the victim had allegedly been in an altercation with his girlfriend, Renee Molina, before the shooting. Police say the victim and Molina had been at a party earlier that night, and that is where alcohol was involved. Now, the coroner has not yet identified the victim. Your time now is 503. Bakersfield police have arrested four teenagers for a murder that happened on the 4th of July. It happened just after 11 that night on Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard near East 10th Street. The BPD says they arrested two 15 year olds and two 14 year olds on Friday for the murder of 48 year old Susanna Ortiz and the shooting of another woman that left her with critical wounds. Police also say a teenage boy was shot but survived. Officers say a fifth suspect is still on the run. Here's his picture. Police have identified him as 19 year old DeMarco Hegwood of Bakersfield. Anyone who knows where he may be should call police. KCSO is helping for asking help for this morning, finding a missing man in Woodoff Heights. Now deputies say 42 year old Nathan Jackson was last seen on November 25th. They say Jackson was leaving Woodoff Heights for Bakersfield that night, but never arrived to his destination. Jackson was last seen driving his lifted 1988 Chevy Trail Chevy Blazer, possibly bearing Nevada license plate 49C241. Now the body of the vehicle was sanded, leaving it a beige brown and even white color. Now if you have information on the whereabouts of Nathan Jackson, call KCSO. An oil rig worker who almost died from an explosion has been in and out of surgery since Friday. Leo Andrade's immediate family spoke with 17's Marco Torres outside Kern Medical where he's being treated. The explosion is shaking not just Leo Andrade's family, but the rest of the Bakersfield oil community. Our industry is a huge family. It really puts a bad spot in everybody's stomach because we're very, very close as an industry. Chad Hathaway, the CEO of Hathaway LLC, explains what Andrade's team was working on at the abandoned well. This is an idle well that was uh, under the purview of the state of California was uh, permitted to be abandoned and, and uh, on, a poly, on an accelerated schedule to be abandoned. So the well has to be completely clean all the way to the bottom of the well. Then it has to be plugged with cement over any open zones. The well head is cut off, it's capped, inspected, and then buried. And but something went wrong during the procedure. Whether it was a mechanical or a human error, we don't know. We do know Andrade was blown off the platform he was working on, almost killing him in the process. His family recounts the heartbreaking moments after receiving the catastrophic news. I ran outside our house um, and I just, I, I buckled down. I lost it. Um, he's my whole world. He's loving, he's patient, you know, and I just, He's, he's my world. He's the light of my world. When I got off the phone, I just got on my knees and prayed. Oh, my baby was next to me and she was just basically hugging me like if she knew. She was probably play, praying over me to keep, keep it together and that's what I did. I just got on my knees and, and pleaded to God and begged him to please be with him in the hospital bed. 
Families who have loved ones working in the oil industry shouldn't be panicked about their safety, according to Hathaway. There is risk with most jobs operating around large machinery and high pressure systems, but safety measures are in place and disasters are rare. It's rare. I mean, we, we have been pushed at an incredibly accelerated pace by the state of California to do this kind of work. Things like that happen when you do things in an accelerated schedule. You know, we don't, we have to sometimes do things that I think that uh, in our business, we wouldn't normally do so quickly. Andrade's family says they will only think of the best for Leo and continue to pray for his recovery. He's really strong. We all know that it's going to be okay. Like somehow, like we, we know, like God is with them. Leo Andrade's wife, Danielle, told 17 News that his surgeries have all gone well and that they're trusting in God for his recovery. They're still asking for prayers from the community too to help him as he goes through more surgeries. A major milestone reached yesterday for the Kern County World War II Veterans Memorial at Jastrow Park. A beautiful bronze statue. The centerpiece of the memorial was set in place. Now the sculpture depicts a woman holding a child in one arm and a telegram on the other, telling her their loved one wouldn't be coming home. Symbolic of what many families experienced during 1941 and 1945. Now the Kern County World War II Memorial will be dis dedicated during a public ceremony Saturday morning at 10 a.m. 17 News is your local election headquarters. Nearly a month past the midterm election. Now the outcome of one of the most competitive races in the Central Valley still hangs in the balance this morning. Now we are talking about the 16th Senate District. The race between Democratic incumbent Melissa Hurtado and Republican challenger David Shepard. Now Shepard took the lead in the first batch of the results on election night and held it until Friday when Hurtado narrowly pulled ahead. Now just 12 votes separate the pa separate the pair. Now the three other counties in the district, Fresno, Tulare and Kings are done counting ballots. Kern estimates it's just about 100 ballots left to count and officials results must be certified by Thursday. Now there is no automatic recount in California, but anyone including a candidate can request one. Now that person has to pay the cost it takes to recount the votes, which Bedard says varies based on the number of ballots in a race. Election day is here again in Georgia. Voters will decide a runoff election between incumbent U.S. Senator Raphael Warnock and his Republican challenger Herschel Walker. NBC's Bree Jackson is in Washington with more. Maddie, in their final pitches to voters, Herschel Walker painted Raphael Warnock as a rubber stamp, voting with President Biden 96% of the time. Raphael Warnock says his opponent is unfit to serve. Voters returned to the polls today for Georgia's U.S. Senate runoff election between Democrat Raphael Warnock and his Republican challenger, Herschel Walker. You got to get out and vote because if you don't vote, you're going to get more Chuck Schumer and also uh, President Biden. We know that he is unprepared. We know he's unqualified. He's unfit to represent the people of Georgia in the United States Senate. A record number of early voters have given the incumbent an edge. Walker, a newcomer to politics, is banking on turnout today to take the lead. This race has remained close despite multiple allegations against the former NFL football star, claiming he paid two former girlfriends to have abortions. Accusations Walker denies. The fact that he came within a point of Warnock in the November election just tells you that that there are other things at play other than effectiveness or character or intelligence or whatever. It's a numbers game. Democrats now control the Senate with 50 seats. A Republican win in Georgia makes it an even split, giving the GOP a better chance to block President Biden's judicial picks and stop legislation. We have got to change the direction of this country. We cannot continue the path we're going down that Democrats and Joe Biden want to take us down, and Warnock's part of that. A Warnock win expands Democrats' majority to 51-49, critical leverage to pushing President Biden's agenda forward. It really is critical because, look, all the things that Reverend Warnock has supported are things that the people of Georgia care a great deal about. Today, Georgia voters will decide which candidate will represent them in Washington. More than 1.8 million Georgians have already voted, topping early voting records. In Washington, I'm Bree Jackson for 17 News. 
and major retailers are reporting shortages of over-the-counter drugs to treat respiratory illnesses. This is all due to the so-called triple-demic. Record levels of illnesses including the flu, COVID, and RSV are being blamed for the shortage. Now, the surge has also caused a spike in demand for amoxicillin and antibiotics widely used to treat bacterial infections in children. Now, sick people's search of relief are leaving stores empty-handed. Now, experts are warning parents not to hoard medicines. Now, if you do find over-the-counter remedies, only buy what you need. Well, behind every case of RSV or the flu is a family waiting for their child to recover. Reporter John Kim checked in with three moms sharing what it was like to care for their sick kids amid this recent spike. Holding right now. This is Jeremiah. Um, this is my rainbow baby. <laughs> Bailey Keel is still a mourning mother. I lost my seven week old daughter last year uh, because of RSV. That's why she was terrified when she found herself at the hospital once again, this time for her newborn Jeremiah, who contracted that same virus. And they almost immediately admitted him. And he had been on oxygen and IV for three days. I had nothing but anxiety. I didn't know if you know, I was going to be having lose another child or if I was going to be able to keep him with me. So it was absolutely scary. Along with a spike in RSV cases, health experts warned this season will be coupled with the flu. Or in Tiffany Price's case, a similar undiagnosed virus that swept through her four boys. One of them was coughing, one of them was throwing up, one of them was um, body was hurting and he couldn't move. And so I'm just like, what the world? She says the unknown was the scary part, especially for her son with asthma. I spent over $100 in medication. And that was a hit. That was a hard hit. Um, <laughs> that was Thanksgiving food money. I also talked to Shara Hyshaw, a mother and an educator. She thought her daughter Eliana was dealing with allergies or COVID-19 before ever suspecting the flu. I did not rush for her flu shot the way that I did for her COVID vaccine. The biggest advice all three mothers want others to know is to listen to your gut. Talk to your kids and always err on the side of caution when it comes to seeking medical help. It is so hard on these little babies. The 17 News at Sunrise podcast is a production of KGET and Nextstar Media Group. For more on all of the headlines in today's show, head to KGET.com.